Hey everybody and welcome to VoxCast to Nowhere. It's your boy Himbo Horse. And I'm Ian from Hyperspace Hobbies. I'm here with Steve from Play on Tabletop and also Hyperspace Hobbies. Uh, hey everybody, I'm uh, Space Marine Steve. I'm from uh, Play on Tabletop. I'm one of the founding members uh, and I'm also uh, working with Ian over at Hyperspace Hobbies. I'm Tron. I run Warforged Dice and I'm a community manager at Plus Five Charisma. So look at us, this round table of diverse 40k players. Uh, I think the thumbnail and the video title is probably going to ruffle some jimmies, honestly. But, you know, I feel like we each have a diverse opinion on this subject. And I'm kind of tired of seeing so many creators just shit on 10th edition all day. So I guess we're just going to have to die on this hill, whether we like it or not. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, like, I mean, there, there's so much more to say about Tenth than just the negative stuff because there really has been some serious innovation. I feel like the the rollout for Tenth was, I mean, it was a lot to take on uh, to kind of redo a bunch of things, all these indexes. That's a lot. Um, I think it was done fairly well. Balancing this is a whole nother conversation, but I feel like the overall rule set was done uh, with a few things in mind, like terrain setup was sort of a thing that they thought of that I think a lot of places don't lean in hard enough. Like you go to some tournaments, there's no terrain and you just get rolled over. I feel like, I, I don't know. I feel like they, they the terrain is like the third player. Steve and I say this all the time and I think that's, an important part. I think it was a great rollout. I've enjoyed this game since I started playing it. The rules are solid. Um, what do you think, Steve? Um, so my my thoughts are varied on this particular topic. Um, and there's a lot of places where, you know, I'm very, I, I'm really happy with uh, 10th edition. Uh, there's some places where I think to myself, man, am I being really critical here of Games Workshop? And, and, there's also times where I think we don't cut them really enough grace. Like think back to, you know, when, um, you know, this new edition kind of hit, right. And what it, what it really looked like at the end of like ninth edition, which ninth edition was like, was a really weird edition because ninth, ninth edition came out like right at the very beginning of the pandemic. Right. And so the rollout of ninth and like how ninth went was like just messed up, right? So like folding into tenth, like we didn't actually have a full ninth edition to really get a good like look at that. And then when we flip over to tenth, it's like it's our our perceptions of it have just kind of been like warped. And the rollout of tenth is also like the expediency of releases was way faster, but it's hard to compare that to its previous edition because of, you know, when the edition was released. Um, Overall, I think that this rule set that they have created is the cleanest that they have ever written rules. And I say that, I say that having played since like, you know, fourth edition and the rules have always been so frustrating sometimes to like, you read it out loud and somehow you have like more questions after reading it out loud than you do answers. And, but this is not really like that. Like at some times it's actually so simple that people mess it up because it is so simple. Like, and uh, so I really love how clean the rule set is. And I really love that, you know, they have broken down like the way that you play through detachments and stratagems. They've, I feel like they have tuned the instrument um, of the game to a point where we all can can hear it clearly and we all can play it clearly and and I think that it's helped. I, I think that tenth edition is probably one of the better editions that they have ever released, and I know that that's a controversial thing to say, but it's also one of the healthiest. Like when we look at, you know, when we when when you look at tournaments, yeah, there's a couple of little outliers, but you know. It's not just Eldar winning events all the time, right? Like it was, you know, and you again, I cut them grace at the beginning of the edition. They didn't know how it was going to go, but they did fix it historically faster than GW has ever fixed anything. 
Exactly. The community right. engagement from Games Workshop has actually been really good this edition and the rollout of the new app. If a rule changes, it's instantly updated on your app so you don't have to like struggle too much to try to find it. I feel like what they've done to help the community out with the game and hearing feedback, changing rules, they've done a great job to try to um, try to fix the game on the fly because a new edition is crazy. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, and I think that I, I think that we like I, I don't think we cut Games Workshop quite enough like grace sometimes like people can be very critical of Games Workshop and it, it's interesting too like this you know this this game has so many like emotions tied to it like I, I've never seen people like rage more than when talking about Warhammer <laughs> And I've never seen people be happier than and more elated than when talking about Warhammer 2. Like, like the extremes are very real. And I think it's because the investment of time and resources that we put into this game are so high. Like, and I'm not just saying, like, yeah, the kits are expensive. Of course. Like, we're talking about, you know, a hobby that, you know, it, the kits are expensive. Yes, the game is expensive. Sure. But I'm talking about a, actually a much more precious form of investment, and that is, you know, your time. It takes hours to build and to paint. It's also very, very personal. Like, when you paint something, you are proud of it, right? When you build something, when you have an idea for a list, like, it, it is, like, more personal than we, I think, give it credit for. And so we are invested. And because we are so invested in this thing that we love, like we want it to be great. And so it also means that we really like are critical when it is not. And I think sometimes we don't, we don't pull back enough and go like, hold on, like, is it really as bad as what I'm saying it is right now? Like what you, you know, what you said at the beginning, like people really crap on, um, on 10th edition or the game in general, but it's honestly like kind of better than it has ever been. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, I've, I've personally spent maybe hundred, hundred hours writing fluff for character, for narrative campaigns, character backstories, you know, I mean, just this week I probably put in like an hour worth of writing into my current crusade. So there, there is, there is a there is so much time investment into both the hobby, the game, and all the other stuff in between. You're absolutely right. There's there's such a high investment. Um, speaking on the lore, how do you guys feel the lore has continued from the previous edition? Was it like a smooth flow into a new edition? You know, um, it definitely was kind of whiplash from Arcs of Omen to Tyranids. And now it's like we kind of just forgotten about the Tyranids because Pariah Nexus is the big thing right now, which is, for those who don't know, Pariah Nexus is this region within, um, I forget which segmentum it is. Is it seg uh, Segmentum Obscurus, Tron? Uh, I'm pretty sure. I have the book next to me. I'll just look it up for you. But uh, while I do that, um, Pariah Nexus is essentially the continuation of the beginning of Ninth Edition story. Um this is where you know all the next all the necron stuff is going on uh and i believe the warp has no influence in that region yeah because of all the blackstone pillars that were set up um mm -hmm. near the uh end of the beginning of ninth if that makes any sense um nephilim uh segmentum nephilim yep but yeah, I think that's a great continuation. Uh, Tyranids don't really feel like they have much of a presence anymore. I feel like they've kind of just taken a back seat right now. And I'm more interested in the fact that Vashtor is coming back because I actually want to see him do something instead of getting <laughs> choke slam and DDT'd by Bellacor. So I agree with you that there is definitely a lot of whiplash, but really what GW is trying to convey, because, you know, that's in Nephilim. Uh, the Tyranid stuff is going on near Ball. Um, you know, we've got stuff going on on Terra. Like, what GW is trying to convey with the Whiplash is the fact that all these events, they're happening at the same time. Yeah, that, that's a good point. That's a good point. Poor Gilliman. <laughs> oh, my God. Poor Gilliman. 
Dude, dude, when when the lion shows up, I expect Gilliman to just fall on top of Gilliman and just start weeping. He's like, I don't want to fight anymore. Lion, you do it. Let me go home and just handle all this administrative bullshit. You do the fighting. And Lion's like, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the lion's just like, let's get naked and fight stuff. And you're like, <laughs> and you're like that Gullman wasn't just, what I wanted to hear. I want Gullman to see that happen with home. Abaddon. <laughs> Yeah, Gulliman just, just wants to go sad. home to his Eldar girlfriend. <laughs> he, he, does. he wants he wants to go home, go to go into the Imperial Palace, see Dad, and have him say, "I hate you, I love you, um, go fight, stay here." <laughs> you're a tool. You're my baby boy. <laughs> yeah, I love you. Uh, you're my greatest weapon. Um, <laughs> you're a mistake. You're my greatest son. <laughs> you're like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> And I just want the line. Speaking of the line, just fighting butt naked. Imagine he just shows up to Abaddon. Is like, yo, and Abaddon's like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, who's this old man? Why is he so buff? He's like, oh wait, that's Uncle Lion. Oh shit, yeah. Johnny, what's and, up? And why is he so naked? <laughs> how is he so buff and so old? He's wait, so is this how? Is this is this why Abaddon TKO'd you? Because like you were naked in front of him, like. It's weird. That's exactly why. <laughs> but back to 10th edition, I do think lore wise, um, there's a lot of build up happening. I'm very excited. However, in terms of kicking off, I think the marketing for 10th edition was it's a lot better than 9th edition. And I think the most obvious reason for that is because 40K is the biggest it's ever been. Thanks, mm -hmm. Henry Cavill. And thank you to the actor whose name I'm forgetting, who voices the Stern Guard veteran and. Uh, Warhammer 40k bolt gun. Oh, I actually, I saw yes. an, I saw an interview with him and uh, Ninjon recently. That mm -hmm. dude is so chill. It's awesome. Yeah, I played a game with him at Play On. He's uh oh my god. Yeah, it was rad. Yeah, he's a really he's a really cool he's a really cool dude. Uh, we talked a lot about you know kind of like teaching him to play the game and stuff like that because he kind of started painting. Um, yeah, and he spent a, a good chunk of time at, at Play on Tabletop, and we got a chance to hang out, and yeah, he's a really cool dude. It's really cool seeing all these celebrities get into Warhammer just because it's the, the, the synergy is so great. You know who else is in the 40K? David Arbor. Yeah, oh, sweet. And for those who don't know, of course, he's the sheriff from Stranger Things. He plays Black Templars, which... Fuck yeah, go for it. And then um, I think Tom Holland says he wants Henry Cavill to teach him how to play Warhammer, which is like, oh shit, Spider-Man's going to be in the 40K. That's going to do crazy, great marketing for GW. Which... Oh yeah. Could you imagine uh, Tom Holland like starring in a 40K project? Like he'd, ma he'd actually make for a really great like uh, first year of Guardsman. A conscript? Thing. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be awesome. He'd make a yeah. great conscript. Well, I mean that that's that speaks to just what the game is. Like if you just want to build models and hate painting, do your thing. If all you want to do is paint, you can do that too. If you like the lore, go there. If you want to play in tournaments, you get like there's just so much you could do with this game. It seems like the hobby can be very all-encompassing with how you want to explore your experience within the hobby. Yeah, just like there's room for you and uh, to do your thing in the lore, there's room for you to do whatever the hell you want um, in the hobby. It's like it's very build your own adventure type of thing. You wanna you wanna have Drakari that work with the Imperium, and you wanna paint them bright pink. I mean, I mean, go ahead. There's there's space for you to do that. Yeah. You wanna, you want to have an Imperial Fist chapter that uh, has fallen to chaos, but doesn't beat the whole spiky bits thing yet. Um, and they're all slate gray. Go, cool. go for it. It's like uh, it's like you said. Um, I think it was even before we started recording. What was the, what was the phrase? Uh, everything is canon, but nothing is true. Is that what it's? Everything is canon, but not but not everything is true. That's what it is. Yeah. There's yeah. still some first edition lore that's still canon, but I'm gonna be honest with you, I don't think it's true. Yeah, totally. And it gives you it gives you a lot of freedom, right? And um, 
Yeah, and I think I think like to to just talk about the lore, like the whiplash feeling, and to bridge off of like everything kind of happening at, happening at the same time. Like, what's great about this is like you know they don't necessarily need to like advance story, like because they can just keep zooming out and zooming in on like different sections of space, different war zones, different characters, different stories, like. All of this could be happening simultaneously and just they keep zooming in and zooming out this camera onto different sections and like we could play for decades in one literally one span of time in um in like 40k like you know time i guess like in in world's time right but like we could play forever just in this one I mean... stage right I mean, that's what they were doing for like uh, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. We were stuck on one year. Uh, M41399. Uh, yeah. And that was. But, you know, as long as we're not slowing down that much, I think we're fine. It's yeah. kind of like how the Indominus Crusade that's been happening since eighth edition originally said in ninth edition when the Dark Imperium trilogy happened which fantastic but i'm coming back to say that in a second but uh, originally the indominus crusade was said to be in its 112th year so it's been 112 years since gilliman came back and said fuck it we ball but now they changed it in the dark imperium trilogy to say it's only been 12 years and at first i was like i don't like that change given how massive you know this universe is you know 112 years and still going that seems a lot more impressive and massive but then thinking about it in hindsight it's like you know a lot of shit can happen in 12 years like a lot especially with warp fuckery a lot can happen in 12 years and all the time shenanigans and all that stuff i i think that's um makes it uh, i guess creates more urgency <clears throat> as it were or just i guess a better pacing to say in the last 12 years there has been more necrons waking up the tyranids are fucking around gas ghoul is just going ham and yarrick is dead now uh, the death guard showed back up and mortarian create the god blight virus it, it it's a lot to happen in 12 years but it's like yeah this is a massive galaxy a lot of shit is happening all over the place all the time especially now that the great rift is open and chaos has more doors to get through to just start creating demon incursions all the time like it, it's it's makes it a lot more terrifying I feel yeah like. It was it was crazy to me that um, they the Tau hadn't encountered chaos until like the middle of ninth, which was um, encountering uh, the Death Guard, and they had they had they had met Imperials, but never chaos before. That was like whoa, okay then. And speaking of Tau, I think that adds to one of my overall feelings for tenth edition, which has been the army rollout and updates. Like, when the crew got revealed, I don't even play Tau, but I think the crew are awesome. And the way they just brought them out, it's like, oh, that's awesome. That's really awesome. And hell, today with the whole rollout of the Night Lords versus the Mandrakes and Kill Team, I don't even play Kill Team, but that's an awesome matchup. Whoever came up with that idea deserves a raise, honestly. Like, Night yeah. Lords versus Yukari, that's a match made in hell. I love it. <laughs> it makes me want to start a Night Lords army just because those models look so great. And I feel like now that, you know, if the Night Lords can get updates and new models, there's hope for, you know, everybody else, you know? Yeah. I feel like, I don't know who the next Primark to come back is, but whoever it is for 10th edition, I want it to be Jagged Tycon, but it's probably going to be Russ. And Valrek says it's Russ, and Valrek is pretty right most of the time if it is rust and then i'm happy for space wolves players because you guys are all going to get your stuff primarized and then get maybe new elite models you get Russ. that's going to be absolutely batshit insane <laughs> to play they've been setting up for rust since seventh yeah i feel like i guess the payoff will be better for rust than jacketai just being like what's up i'm here fuck fast tour bye <laughs> <laughs> But uh, speaking of, um, you know, with these rollouts and reveals, I feel like that's been the up with 10th edition. I, I feel like all these reveals at some level have been like, you know, there's not one reveal I've seen where it's like, that sucks or that looks like crap. Hell, even the new Custodes captain with the shield and the Melt Lance, 
I think looks awesome. Everyone jokes that he looks like a squat. And I'm like, well, that's the most beautiful squat I've ever seen in my life. So, fuck you guys. Wait. Wait. I have an entry for that, though. The the Desolation Marines are garbage. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll give you that. Those are more ninth, but they, but they look like crap. Didn't they come out in the beginning? Those no. the rocket guys? Yeah, that's the rocket guy. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh you're right. That was... That was end of nine. Never no, mind. No, that I'll was the Augustus back. box. They they do look. They, yeah, that was the you're, Augustus. You're right. They look like crap, but that's not tenth's fault. <laughs> that's not tenth's fault. That's ninth's yeah, that's fault. Nice fault. We, yeah, another. Weird. Yeah, another reason to hate ninth. <laughs> ninth got really fucking. Another reason weird. to hate ninth. Yeah. Well, speaking of like models, good or bad, and the new tower release that I thought was really awesome. Uh, what do you guys want to see? as far as models coming out for the future of this edition. Ooh, why did you push that button? Because I really love the Crute stuff. I thought that was really cool, but I also thought that they could have done more of the Tau extended universe where like Vespid maybe get an update with a new, you know, combat monster that's Vespid or like Tau have taken over so many planets that have unique uh, unique beings on them, they could bring in like those psychic polar bears that they've, they've mentioned, which is just ridiculous, but also awesome. Like, there's so many options I felt with the Tau that they could have just grabbed anything from the galaxy and said, Yeah, they work for the Tau because they're working for the quote unquote greater good. Yeah, so, um, I think that like Crute is kind of them putting their foot in the water. I think in the next couple of years, we'll see a lot more crazy things. Okay, hold on a hold on a second. Did Ian just say the word psychic polar? It wasn't bears just me, right? None of us <laughs> No, I, I heard that. Okay. Um that's not Oh you guys aren't familiar with psychic polar bears? Steve, come on, I thought no, you played this what? game. Where are psychic I'm Googling it right now. Uh, are these like bipedal yeah, I'm not sure. polar bears I, with I, thumbs? They stand on two they stand on two feet. They have like a skull cap made of some weird metal <laughs> dome thing. Are yeah, they're like a the t- they're like compass? a race that allied with the Tau. Uh, it's no. almost well. I'll be damned. They're real. See, they're so this is what I'm talking bears. about. There's options for models out there that are so awesome they go all the way up to psychic polar bear. Steve, what do you okay. want to see as a space they, marine player? They are described as having limited mobility and being unfit for ground combat and so find their means of furthering the greater good by providing the Tau fleets with ships, especially those fit for the roles of scouts and explorers. They are also formidable psychers. Oh what? my god, that's, really that's how they could do polar bear that's thing. How they could do Tau psychers. Holy shit. Oh shit. Okay. Um wow. Uh, thank you, Ian, for dropping that on us. <laughs> <laughs> GW, get I'm on sorry, it. honestly. All right. Well, I think we I think we just talk about this now for the remainder of the episode. If, if psychic polar bears come into 40k, I'm blaming you specifically, Ian. You mean thanking? No, blaming. Okay, Thanos. <laughs> A grateful universe that Ian has brought into existence. There yeah. you go, folks. Ian thinks that you should be grateful for psychic polar bears. And uh, Do, yeah, when they hit the tabletop, everyone's gonna love them. Now, Steve, uh, I know you, me, and Tron were Space Marine players, you know, and I feel like we all may have some overlap on what we want to see going forward. I know, for one, I want to see the Vanguard get primary sized. I've got such a hot take, and everyone in this room is gonna hate me for it. Oh shit! <laughs> well, hit it, hit it. I want more. Primaris Lieutenant. <laughs> yes, yes. I want a lieutenant with a thunder hammer, damn it. Okay, so and I'm gonna I'm gonna add a little asterisk to that. I don't wanna see any more Tacticus um lieutenants. I, a and Gravis I don't, lieutenant. And I don't wanna see any more Phobos. I wanna see either a Terminator lieutenant or I wanna see Gravis. And I'd like them to expand on all of the characters that only have Tacticus models to give them some other type of armor. Like, um, I'd like to see another captain on bike. Cause like, I know that the White Scars players are crying in lack of bike. I for feel example. for them. 
Yeah, I I agree. I think that like the, do you want do you want know sucks about so I love Space Marines. Like I've I've built my entire online persona about how much I love Space <laughs> oh, Marines. Oh no. However, <laughs> like which is ridiculous. I it's ridiculous and I know it's ridiculous, but I do have like I Ian has seen it. I've seen it. I have a wall of Space Marines at my house. It's insane. So I, as much as I love Space Marines, I really I don't want to see any more characters. Like we have so many data sheets that are dedicated to characters upon characters upon characters that like nobody ever uses. Like yeah. like I haven't seen an ancient on the table in forever and we have three of them. Well, you should right? invite me to play on because I run an ancient in my army. Oh sick. Alright. This ancient is cool well, shit. It, Oh, dope. All right. Well, yeah. I mean, send me some pics of it and we'll set it up. I'll do it right now. <laughs> All right. Yeah. The, um, the, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I, it's, it's hard because, you know, Space Marines have so, it, it's hard to wish for more because Space Marines already have so much. And so, personally, like, what I, what I actually want to see is I want to see some of the models that are, like, tremendously outdated get, Updated, and I, and I know being a Space Marine player, it's gonna hurt for for others to hear this, but I don't think Space Marines needs any more. Like we have so much stuff. I, what I really want to see is like I want to see a like I want to redo on the Defiler kit from um, Chaos. Ooh, like yeah. I want right. Like I want to redo on that. I want to redo on what are some other like really outdated ones? Like, um, I want to redo on I still stand by the Vanguard veterans. Yeah. The, yeah. The Vanguard veteran kit is like, it's not phenomenal. Like we definitely need some like Primaris ones and they already kind of have, like they have it set up already. Like they can make more jumper dudes and like, you know, that that's like almost an upgrade spruable like release. Right. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I, I just, I want to see the things that have been just sitting around forever get redone. Um, and yeah, so I, I just hope that they keep going through the line and update everything to give them the, you know, to give every army a little bit of something new because there's some armies that have been just working with everything that's old for a very long time. Looking at you, Ian, and your demon <laughs> army. Oh, fucking demons. Yep, yep, got a lot of old stuff, but that can also make for bad feelings. Like, sometimes when they update something, they don't really update that exact thing. They sort of make a bigger, crazier version of it and then delete the old thing. And I know you felt a huge burn when they were like, oh yeah, all the land speeders are gone, you can't use them. All of the yeah. uh, attack bikes, you can't use attack bikes anymore. Yeah. Even though I but been... we kind of have these ATVs and we have these storm speeder thunder strikes that are a replacement and you're like well i just have to essentially shelf like a dozen models that i've been playing with since i was a kid so the updates can be awesome they can also kind of sting yeah and, and, and i yeah. agree with that you're, yeah. you're absolutely right <clears throat> and like uh stern guard yeah. i mean i've never played before ninth edition but i heard stern guard were Whoa. much more customizable when they were first born space marines before they were so partners. i own Six squads of Sternguard Firstborn. I cannot run any of them because they're all combi flamer with heavy flamer. God damn, I am so and, sorry. <laughs> and van vets are in the same boat. All of my van vets are equipped with dual lightning claws. You cannot have two Vanguard uh, veteran weapons uh, on a model. No, but you could, you could put, like I have. So uh, I actually have that exact same setup. I have a bunch of like Raven Guard ones that have all the double claws because I was, I was just really into that. Um, but honestly, like the other weapon that they get is a bolt pistol, which no one's gonna call WYSIWYG on you for that. And then I just say, oh yeah, they're all they all have heirloom weapons, which is what they have. So like. You know, you can kind of, like, they've made it nondescript enough, like, in the same vein that, like, the new Chaos, uh, you know, veterans or whatever have, what are they, uh, accursed weapons. But when you actually look at them, it's like axes and swords and maces and fists and whatever. But it's actually all just accursed weapons. So they've kind of, like, 
like they've kind of just like washed over it with this one universal phrase. So like I would just go for it. You know what I mean? Like no one is gonna look at it and be like, well, that's not right. Like whatever. And your heavy flamer could be like a pyre cannon in a stern guard veteran squad, right? Like you could just say, hey man, I'm using the old the old rules, the old models, but I'm playing them as. And nobody would be like, oh, uh, no way, you can't play that. Everyone's going to be fine with that. And I feel like as a, commu a community as a whole, if you just point out a model, you go, this thing looks awesome. I still want to keep playing them. You're not going to run into a lot. And of you're right. And from a from narrative play, you're you're that's that's fine. But like the the problem with collapsing all those weapons into one stat line is that it makes it takes what made those units good and pulls it out. Which you know, when you pull the good thing out of a out of a data card, it makes it bad. And this is actually kind of one of the downs of 10th edition. We can we can even just kind of flip to that right now is, you know, they did a lot of this. They did a lot of like, they kind of accordioned in a lot of things to make it more streamlined, right? So instead of Vanguard veterans being able to have hammers, claws, swords, power swords, and all these different types of weapons, and they were customizable in a bunch of different ways, now they all just have heirloom weapons and the same goes for you know the um like the wolf like the wolf um riders from uh, the thunderwolf cavalry from space wolves the same goes for those accursed weapons and chaos and and they've actually done those like that kind of collapsing the like combi weapon effect you know in many different examples uh, throughout the edition and you know it does feel bad especially if you were banking on that kind of customization and you had built it to do that with that being said though like as an avid tournament player like it is kind of nice just to have it all do one thing and not have to keep track of whether or not you fired the combi weapon or not or whether or not or whatever like it's um yeah so i while i get that it might not it might not have been the greatest move on their part um it does, there is a certain practicality to it that, you know, if, is cool, but you, you definitely get less customization. If combi weapons were lost to give us these data cards, I think that is an adequate and fair trade. I'm going to keep it real because these data cards, these yeah. are amazing. There's also so much information in this game, trying to introduce a new player to this game and then going, oh, and also every guy has a different weapon and you have to know all these rules for that all these was my anxiety now. for ninth edition because when i played that starting in 2021 when i started with dark angels i was so overwhelmed with all the stuff like dark weapons i mean um weapons of the dark age and all this other stuff grim resolve inner circle all these different weapons and stuff and i was so like anxious like just filled with anxiety of like oh my god am i doing this right am i doing this wrong like i don't know what i'm doing thankfully my friend uh jack our friend jack who plays sons of dorn he you know taught me and showed me you know it's like okay you know you may want to do this you may want to play around with that you may want to take power sword instead of power axe because you get more ap and ap does this you know blah 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 and it's like 10th edition that's the up right there right is that it's so much easier for the new people to learn how to do everything especially when they got the data card right there they don't have to look through a goddamn piece of shit ninth edition app that crashed half the time or just straight up froze <laughs> and then just said oh you can't take this relic with this relic we're not going to tell you why you just can't do it and it's like well I, now my opponent's waiting for me to put my list together and i'm sitting here sweating bullets like yeah Yep, and while it, the streamlined nature of the game is a definite up, you know, the downside is, you know, you, uh, the lists become less, like, they they're, they're far less flexible, right? It's very samey, and, and, and too, like, there's a downside in balance also, because not all weapons are created equal, and yet for one unit, you have one point cost, and that just slots in, right? And so... The thing is, is like with the, the old, the index Tau, right? Like when you look at crisis suits the, in the old Tau land, you'd be playing cyclic ion blasters because they're the best unit, the best uh, weapon. But 
they're so much better than every other weapon that's on the data sheet that you're like, well, I guess I'm just always playing this because the, it's literally the same cost as this worse weapon, where in the before times, ninth edition and, be, and before, you would pay for each individual weapon, right? Yeah. Slowing down list construction, making it more complicated, yes, but it was way more flexible, and they could balance within that, where now it made the narrative more, more difficult. Fun too. I, I think that like it, point cost weapons is a necessary piece of grit. Reduce amount of weapons, fine, I can live with that. But like, let's bring back point cost for weapons, so that way we can like actually have meaningful decisions to be made. Like, combi weapons would be so much less bad if if the Stern Guard bolt rifle costs 15 points per guy. Like, sure, I'll, I'll take the free yeah. option of combi weapons. Yeah. They could also do, like, a Stern Guard combi weapon squad. A Stern Guard, like, a uh, rifle squad. And then they're two separate squads. And then you could give them separate abilities, which is sort of what they're doing now. Uh, Steve, you touched on the crisis suits. They've split the crisis suits to be, like, Melta, Plasma, Flamethrowers. So they're actually three separate units with unique rules that sort of make sense for what they do on the battlefield. Which they could do with, like, Stern Guard Combi Weapon Squad. And then give them all a special unique ability. Which, I love the abilities in this game for that yeah. reason. I, I think that uh, the abilities is also, like, a really great thing to touch on. Because most of the abilities um, from... Uh, that are on data cards are just stuff that used to be strats like that really was a huge change oh my god there i used to have seven pages of stratagems to look through i used about five to ten of them ever yeah and like yeah. like i'm very sad that my salamander's max flame shots is gone but you know like I gotta say, it's real nice having only two pages of strats I have to think about, ever. Yeah, which is great, right? Like, so, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot, there's a lot to love there. Um, and, you know, they, it, even though they have definitely, like, accordioned the came in and they streamlined, streamlined a lot, um, you know, and, and it, it's kind of a double-edged sword. Right, and I think we have to try and look at the good versus the downside there, uh, because you know we have gained a lot. Like my games feel much more streamlined, which is exactly what they, you know, kind of wanted. Right? I do feel like the marketing on the like the whole like simplified but not simple thing. Like <laughs> they said that far too much at the beginning of the tenth edition rollout, and that was that was a lie. <laughs> But, I think for um, the most part it was true. Not a hundred percent. I'll give you that, but I think mostly they were they were telling the truth with that. They also said we're it, we're making sure there's less rerolls in the game because that's just time consuming. <sighs> and then Space Marines had rerolls, hits, and wounds <laughs> army wide. So, bro, bro, let let's even discount Oath of Moment for a second. Just per data card in my army. I have so many things that let me reroll, like like Lancer for Gladiator, Gladiator Lancer for example. You get one reroll, one uh, uh, one reroll hit, one reroll wound per shot. Like, come on, bro. Yeah, and like Eldar have literally one reroll hit and wound for every unit the entire game. Like, like they. I don't know. They just like it, it's almost what they what they should have said on the rollout was just okay. You know what we've done? We've tailored tenth edition to be a very streamlined edition. We we want to get you through the games maybe a little bit faster, get you to the action better, and and just make it just make it more accessible, right? Because it is the most accessible edition ever. And yeah. instead of trying to come up with some kind of slogan like the simplify but not simple thing, like I don't. I just was like, just, just tell me that you've polished the edges, which is what you did, right? I, like, I think it really should have been something more like um, more accessibility for uh, faster games, or something more catchy like that. Like, like it shouldn't have been simple, but not simple, simplified, but not simple. It yeah, have, it should have been 
something with the word accessibility in it because that's really what yeah. tenth is about. Yeah. And I well speaking I really, of accesses. Okay, go ahead, Steve. Sorry. Uh, yeah. I'll, sorry. I'll just quickly get my thought out before I absolutely forget it. Um, like something that I really love about this edition of 40k is that like I'm a I'm a teacher. That's my that's my job and. Um, I really like building activities that have something called, like, it's an educational term of low floor, high ceiling, where, like, to just enter in, anyone can kind of do this, and to do the base activity is actually maybe not easy, but just, like, very accessible. However, there are, there's enough depth in the activity, so the, in this case, the game, that, you know, we can kind of take it as high as we want to take it. And and I feel like 10th edition does have that, where 9th edition had a very, like a very high floor and an even higher ceiling. Uh, this has a very accessible floor for really, and you can play this game however you want to play it, and it feels the same, but you could also have a very in-depth and cagey game that is, you know, highly tactical and strategic and, and I feel like it, the game is allows for that where previous editions have not. So I like, I like that, and um, it's a positive. Yeah, uh, I I want to I, I want to sneak this in really quick before Ian gets started too. I'm I'm sorry I've been holding on to this for like the past ten minutes. Um, I was able to get through three games of tenth edition in four hours yesterday. Like, it it has definitely been a lot faster. I, and. Um... But piggybacking off of uh, something that Steve mentioned earlier about Eldar, that kind of brings us to the tournament scene because I feel like right now Eldar are oh universally kind of like just people just side eye Eldar players right now. For a while there, yeah, it was it was really bad, and Steve and I have talked about this quite a bit. Is that they? I mean, this goes back to community engagement too. They are recognizing that they recognized that Eldar were a problem. They realized they had to do something. They did something to nerf Eldar, but what Steve and I were talking about is that Eldar have so many tools in the toolbox, you can't just take away one or two. You have to kind of hit them broadly because as soon as you go, oh, this unit is no longer as effective as they used to be, they go, oh, well, I have this other tool that's just as good. Oh, oh maybe it's even better, but nobody's playing it. And I, at least, at least they're nerfing stuff that's a problem. And they had to nerf Eldar three times, I believe. Steve, did they have to do it three times? Oh, they've had to do it more than that. I, I think when we were talking about it on Hyperspace, we we made it, I think, I, maybe it was a video where the both of us were in it, or maybe I was in it, I can't remember, but I remember creating the metaphor of it's like playing against a basketball team where the whole basketball team is just Michael Jordan's. Like, it's just five clones of Michael Jordan. That's um, horrifying. And you're like, yeah, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta nerf one of their Michael Jordans. Like, it doesn't matter. The bench is filled with Michael Jordans, right? Like, exactly. Yeah. Whoever thought that putting a mechanic into the game where you could remove the random element should be fired, like honestly, because like that is the that is like the that is the core gameplay loop of this game is rolling dice. And they went, this one faction does not need to engage with the core gameplay loop. That's, that's, yeah. that is like the definition of broken. And like, I really like to play my Eldar. I have this, this beautiful model that I'm, that I just posted to the box uh, station prep channel. Uh, I'd really like to use that, but I don't feel comfortable using it because like, that is one of the strongest data sheets in the game in one of the strongest armies in the game. And I've seen somebody try to compare it to the world eaters with their corn dice, which is like I said, it's not the same thing because with that, you got to at least roll doubles of a specific number or roll triples to do whatever it is you want to do. And that's not even the same as, oh, I failed some save rolls. I'm just going to take that out and replace it with fives and sixes, which is that, that's not the same at all, because at least with the corn stuff, there's still some random elements in there. It's up to chance, but the strands of fate that's not random at all and with and with like previous with previous editions they would not be eradicating this in the same way the eldar would just reign for like four years yeah so like we, we we're happy that it takes them you know 
a significantly less amount of time to, to make fixes like that. But like, this is this is the one thing intent that I think is like so egregious that like it should have just never been like this. This is this is my like probably the worst thing about edition type B. Oh yeah, I, when you read the Eldar Index. And, and, and you just get so like it's hard it's actually kind of painful to read and you're just like the, they just sent an, an eldar player to a cabin for a weekend with two boxes of wine and said come back with an index like that that's what happened that, that definitely and, feels like and it. that's what it feels like anyways right like and we'll just print it we don't even need to proofread right like and um and that's what it feels like and it, it also, too, like they've just they baked in all of these things that like feel made up, like and like that's my favorite joke. Whenever an Eldar player tells me something that they're doing, I'm like on a scale of one to ten, how made up is that? And because um, it feels like they're just making stuff up, like on the fly. They're like, oh yeah, by the way, like all my guys just get like plus two to hit or something, and you're like, why? And they're like, I don't know. And it's like, oh okay, I guess you all hit on twos. And you all wound on twos. And you have AP five, I guess. I don't know. Like, it just feels bad, right? And you, and then when you take the ch element of chance out of it, it feels worse. And so people feel bad interacting with it. And that's why everyone has that, that side eye to it. But it is right. Like, Ian is right, though. They've nerfed them like three or four times now. And it is way better to play against. Like, I, I think you should feel okay about playing an Eldar army. Like, you know, in a casually competitive game or a casual game or narrative game or whatever and and like i don't think people will get mad at you especially if you're not you know taking three of the greatest things uh, and then yeah this this might have been this was a few months ago i admit to you but like we were we were doing a uh, combat patrol league at our, our local store and one of the guys wanted to play eldar and like the community just dog piled in for it. He was, they were like, people were like saying that he was like a bad person for wanting to do that. And I was like, guys, it's a combat patrol league. Relax. I get Eldar are busted, but like, holy crap, this is not warranted. Yeah. But see, people are invested. It's like I say at the beginning, right? Like, we're invested heavily. And it's an emotional thing. <laughs> and speaking of invested, yeah. uh, Man, this this topic, this, this Eldar topic, that's a, that's a hot topic, right? And we might have to come back for a part two on that one. We have to because we gotta elaborate more on that. And I want to hear like people within the community explain their points of view too. I want to hear an Eldar player's perspective. I'm pretty sure we've got somebody in the server who plays Eldar and can say, you know, make make their kiss because we don't want to just you know. I, I I see the community kind of just dogpile Eldar players, and it's like, well, let them say their part, but. Something to close us out and something really positive. Favorite armies, units, or models that you've played in 10th edition so far? I'd like to go last. Okay. <laughs> okay, I will start it off then. I have been really loving the way that demons play, both uh, as a tactical player and as a guy who just wants to run big, flashy monsters and have that oh crap look on my opponent's face when something just appears out of nowhere and, and is too tough for them to try to take out. So I think the demons for me have been my favorite army. As far as favorite units, I think just the ability to play a bunch of big stompy monsters and uh, and have them run amok on the battlefield. Both looks cool from a, from a stand back and you know look at the table kind of feeling. Um, and it's also just fun. It's one of the reasons why I got into demons in the first place. So, my favorite army, demons. I'll well, uh, I'll, I'll take the next one. Um, no, sorry. Ooh, well, I wonder what Steve's favorite army is gonna <laughs> be. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, uh, I I think clearly my favorite army is a, is space marines i i do love them they're the they're the poster boys and uh, in, in my opinion they are the most awesome i just i just love the faction um i like the way they look i like the way they play i just love it um and i think my my favorite unit right now um is probably aggressors i really really love the way that that aggressors play and i love the way that they look 
Um, and I like, in particular, I'm a big fan of the flamethrower aggressors. I just love that. I just love that that image, right, of some salamanders aggressors, like, you know, just torching gaunts like crazy. It gives me it gives me mad StarCraft vibes, and I love it that. It is really good. Um, yeah, it's sweet. So I, I'm a big fan of that. Plus, like, Imperial Fist aggressors with all the bolt guns and stuff like that, high volume, like, they, and they feel and look like Imperial Fists because they've got those big bolter mittens, oh, right? Yes. And so... I, I just love it. And so I like that a lot. In terms of models for 10th edition, you know what? I I am actually really in love with the new Terminator Captain from the Leviathan box set. Captain Octavius? I, oh, yeah. Pardon uh, me? The caped one? The ca- yeah, the caped his, one. His name in the uh, Combat Patrol is Captain Octavius. Ooh, Octavius. Yeah, I, I like it. I like that he's stepping on a Screamer Killer's head. Uh, and I just like the way that he's posed. And and I love those new Terminator models. I think that the scale is is where like I really want them to be. Um, and when I look at that model, I just go, now that's a Space Marine. And, you know, when I when I see it, I love it. And that's just where I'm at right now. Honestly, um, in ninth, I went hardcore Dark Angels for a long time, but I... Messed around with some custodies, some iron warriors, and a 10th edition. It has mostly been custodies and salamanders. Dark angels, I'll probably end up getting back into them eventually, but oh my god, salamanders. That that firestorm detachment is so good. It is so goddamn good. And you could say it's lit. It's lit. It's absolute fire. It's spicy. And it's like it's so fun, especially when you take those flame storm aggressors and then you just give them take a Gravis captain with them and then you can do immolation protocol for no CP. So all those flamers have devastating wounds and then you just start barbecuing shit. It's fantastic. And then custodies when 10th edition started and we had that um, 10th edition uh, tournament at the store where we're starting out with Leviathan and everything playing custodies. That's when I fell in love with custodies. Before that, I was like, I mean, I just have custodies. I mean, they're cool, you know, in 9th edition. But in 10th edition, that's when I became hooked and actually named one of my wardens, who is now my shield captain, um, Asof Valdis. And that match, where I was playing against, uh, I forget the guy's name. He was from out of town. He brought Tyranids. He had a Neuro Tyrant, which is the psychic thing with all the little squids that do the bodyguard thing. He had a Screamer Killer. He had and a bunch of um, I forget what the warrior ones are called. They are like strength six slashing. Uh, they have like those pincers and they just, they're full melee. They just come in and just cut stuff. But when I tell you um, that match was so scary because literally by round two, Trajan Valoris was on one wound from the Screamer Killer. It just came in and molly whopped him. And but then he got his clap back when he activated that moment shackle. Got those twelve hits with the uh, axe and activated the um, lethal hits. And then I killed the Screamer Killer. I had my squad of Wartons kind of just chasing the Neuro Tyrant around the map. Like that that's all they did the entire game was just chase this thing. And then just like hunt him down, you know, they ended up killing one of my Wartons, brought him back. And then they charged in to start stabbing all the squids, stabbed the Neuro Tyrant. And my last guy standing was my Warden and uh, this one warden who I ended up naming. You know, it's one of those moments where you got to name that model. And I've been obsessed with Custodes since then. I love Custodes right now. I finally figured out how I play them, you know. And Custodes get joked on sometimes by saying they're too OP. You know, they don't have a lot of bodies, which, you know, you got to play into the mindset of, okay, they don't have that many boys on the table. So you got to treat them as if, you know, you don't want one to die because losing a squad is like losing two squads of space marines. It, it really hurts. And that mindset of instead of going around killing stuff, you know, play more tactical, which is something I had to learn to do. Just be more about getting to the, you know, the markers, getting to the points playing the gambit playing the you know secondary missions just really focusing on being more tactical because i know if i wanted to custodians could just run around the map and then just start killing stuff 
if they wanted to, but to play them tactically, that's more difficult because they don't have the numbers to get all over the place to each, you know, uh, marker and get the points and all that stuff. But I'm starting to learn how to get better at that. And but they're so fun to play. They're easy to paint, which is why I look for an army. I don't want to spend hours trying to paint one squad. But all I got to do with the custodies, prime them, paint them with the Aurelian gold, and then paint their, because they're emissaries, just paint them wraith bone for the capes and their drapes and all that stuff. And then boom, done. But uh, salamanders, fun as hell too. Hopefully once the new Chaos Space Marines Codex comes out, I'll start playing Iron Warriors again. If they, you know, give them some focus. But uh, yeah, custodies for sure. Favorite uh, unit, wardens, favorite model, I want to say the Blade Champion because he's really good with a melee, especially if you give him the enhancement Veil Blade, extra two attacks to any of his profiles. But I say a regular shield captain for sure. So I'm I'm widely known as a Space Marine player. Um, I've been playing them since eighth, um, and I've been following the adventures of um, a lieutenant that I converted out of a, a noise brain called Lieutenant Tikal. Um, and I've, I've been following him since like the middle of eighth. Uh, this edition, I made a big change. I s so Horace earlier mentioned the big brawl at our local where we had all of the NID players versus all of the everyone else. Um, and I had painted up both halves of Le Leviathan by that point. So I brought both with me. I got, I got to that table and the NID needed another player. That was my first time playing Nids, and that was when I fell in love with them. Nids are my favorite army of 10th edition. Um, and like Steve earlier mentioned, you know, he loved the aggressors like burninating uh, the gods. Well, I really like seeing the, the aggressors burninate the gods too, because then another squad of gods rolls up and chews the shit out of the, out of the aggressors, you know. I like seeing another Screamer Killer roll up and stab the crap out of uh, Captain Octavius, you know. Um, and my uh, my favorite model, um, I mentioned it earlier, I built the Ninjan conversion. Um, I play him as a Scythe Hyra Jewel, right? I have gotten so many books from people when I say that it is a like Toughness 12 uh, strength 16 monster that just rolls through the middle of the battlefield and just tears everything in its way apart. But if I can't use Forge World stuff, then I'd probably, I'd probably honestly say the gods. I've, I've had a lot of fun painting them. Um, it's, it's just so, so different painting gods or anything from the Nids uh, in comparison to painting you know, Necrons or Space Marines or Admech or any of the other dudes that are coded in flat panels. It's just so, such a different experience and so much, it's, it's like, it's great. And, and I really, really enjoyed playing them. I haven't been playing them very much recently though, uh, because there, there are a lot of Tyranid players and I really dislike uh, mirror matches. So I've actually, Range in my Tyranids for the time being, but don't worry. The uh, the Shadow and the Warp will return. So I think we've given a, a good, I guess technically part one of our take on tenth so far. I mean, this year is shaping up to look really good. You know, we got Custodes coming up. We got new Chaos Lord or Chaos Lord on jetpack taking as a Warp Town. That's pretty awesome. We got probably some uh voltan coming later in the year we got there's a lot of crap happening i mean it, it's looking pretty up right now i'd say i think the ups definitely outweigh the downs right now uh did we want to cover the uh competitive or the casual scene like focused uh specifically um yeah i think so I think you three would be much more equipped for it. So the only uh, the only tournament that I personally played in um, was in twenty. I want to say seventeen. I played in a trios tournament, uh, trios narrative tournament uh, at Nova, 
and that was back when Magni Morty was a thing. And that tournament was abysmal. I don't think I'm the right person to talk about the competitive scene. Well, Steve, you, um, I think you play quite a bit more tournaments than I do. Uh, well, how do you feel about the tournament scene? <clears throat> um, I would say that as as 40k goes, like thinking from you know like my entire history of playing tournaments, I've I've played tournaments ever since like fifth edition, right? And and they've slowly looked you know different uh, as you know, time has gone on. There used to be very, very small little events here and there, and then there'd be one big event at some city somewhere. Um, but from 6th and 7th edition forward, really, with, you know, Frontline Gaming kind of championing the ITC and having, like, community kind of, like, regulated rules and then shifting over to GW regulated rules and GW becoming a lot more involved like I think that the culture of tournaments and and how they're run and and what they're like has changed drastically you know as we've gone from you know 5th edition now to 10th edition we're talking about a span of 5 editions right it's a long time and um, right now I think I'm I may have said it earlier maybe before the recording i'm not sure but ultimately i think that this is as controversial a statement as it might be i think that this is actually the healthiest the game has been in some time um because you know i i feel like while of course there are people that out there that really want to push competitive armies and competitive lists to their limits I also, you know, look at the win rates and I look at, you know, what is winning at podiums and stuff like that. And it's varied, right? Like you can take a good scroll through quite a few tournaments and, you know, it's not just Eldar up and down the podium as far as the eye can see, you know. Uh, it, there's Blood Angels up there, and there's Grey Knights up there, and there's Dark Angels up there, and there's Space Marines up there, and there's like Demon finishes, and Orc finishes, and Guard finishes. Like, it is the most varied that, in my opinion, the game has been. And to me, that is a healthy thing. Everyone might not, it, like, it, it might not feel that way to everybody, but. It is a truth, like the, the game is big, right? And even though it doesn't feel like that maybe to you in a, in a personal way, it is kind of true in the grand scheme of things. With that being said, I think there's still a lot more uh, work to be done and there's a lot of improvements that need to kind of take place. But, you know, in comparison to what life was like when I was playing tournaments in seventh edition, this is so much easier. The games are quicker, people are happier. Ultimately, like I, I run into less like weird like rule problems. I feel better at the end of every game. Like GW has done a lot to change the way the game um, plays at tournaments, and I think that, that extends to all levels of play. Right? Like if it's if it's great at a tournament, it's going to be great at your table at home, and. Um, I think that ultimately GW has done a lot of really good stuff and I'm excited for them to just keep tuning this this game to get it as good as it can be. But ultimately right now we're in a great, I've said ultimately far too many times ultimately, but uh, we are, we're in a good spot and I play, I play a lot of tournaments and I feel good about it. Do you feel that like the tournaments are maybe a bit easier because you have access to uh, to pretty much most of the armies through the Warhammer app. So you have less gotcha moments because you can spend, you know, a couple minutes and just quickly breeze through your opponent's, you know, tricky strats. Like you essentially have your opponent's codex as well. Yeah, and I think even even as time goes on and and the indexes get rolled out, I think that that statement will still be true because you can say, hey, can I just see your cards for a sec? Right, going back yeah. to how good the cards are for the game, and and it, what's great about this too is that everybody works on the same system, 
right? You have an army rule, a detachment rule, and then a unit rule. And those are all the rules that exist. That's it, right? So unlike before when, you know, there could be weird stacking rules from, you know, units to psychic powers to detachments to armies, we're now like everybody has one thing, right? You have an army rule, a detachment rule, and then that unit that I'm looking at has a rule. And because that's the case, like it, you just – are eight, like you're just able to pick it up, right? Way faster. And, um, yeah, I feel like, I feel like, yeah, that is, that is a big piece of it. They've made, they've, they have really streamlined how you interact with your opponent's army. There's less guessing, uh, there's less guessing games going on. There's less gotcha moments going on. Feels better. And I feel for the most part, a lot of the indexes were, like when they were released, most of them were pretty good. Like Tau just won Adepticon off of their index. So they did a good job with a lot of the indexes. Some of them not so great, but for the most part, it's hard to make a whole new rule set for everything and have it all work seamlessly. Oh, that's one. <laughs> I think that's pretty damn good in depth answer. I think that's a hell of a way to send us off. But before we head off, in the last episode, we talked about the Vox Cast to Nowhere dice giveaway that our friend Tron, the amazing dice maker that he is, helped facilitate with me. So today, we're going to announce our winner. And because we had 10 submissions, I'm going to roll a d10 to see who is going to get their free set of dice. So, I'm going to roll this damn thing and see who we got. That is a five. That means one, two, three, four. Flombus. Flombus is our winner in the Discord server. Congratulations. Congrats. Congrats. All right, so. I'll make sure to follow up with him so he gets his free set of dice. Steve, thank you so much for being here. It was an honor. Yeah, not a problem. It was great. Ian, as always, you know how great you are. <laughs> Don't feed my ego. <laughs> He's just so chill. <laughs> and Tron, thank you for everything. For the dice, for the giveaway, for all your help, and for your hot takes. <laughs> what a thing to, to lay at the end there <laughs> so you guys want to be able to tell the audience where they can find you yeah you can find steve and i at hyperspace hobbies the youtube channel we do a lot of tactics based stuff and generally just talk about the game if you're into uh battle reports and the such too um and uh, I my other channel play on tabletop uh, does a lot of really fantastic battle reports and we we do actually have some great narrative content Ian and I were actually in a narrative series called Angels and Demons um, and uh, the Blood Angels squared off against the uh, against the uh, Chaos Demons it was a great series and the first episode of it is um, up on YouTube and it's uh, it's great so go check it out um, and I'm over on Instagram under uh, Warforged Dice, uh, no spaces. Um, we do two uh, posts a week, one rolling, one um, one picture. You can also find me at my Etsy store. I make uh, high quality dice, very soft, very shiny. If you like math art, come check me out. Thank you everyone for listening and make sure to check us out again in the future and join our dang Discord server. Yeah, um, we may be doing more giveaways in the future, and in order to uh, be a part, you need to be a part of the Discord. You heard the man. Take care. <laughs>